Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today we're tackling something interesting. Why the F-15 Eagle and F-16 Fighting Falcon often seemed, well, more popular than the F-A-18 Hornet. Yeah, both with the U.S. forces sometimes and definitely with allies. Exactly. And for you listening, if you want that quick, deep understanding, we're aiming to unpack the, uh, the choices behind aircraft procurement. Because it's not just about which plane is better on paper, is it? Not at all. It looks like that sometimes, but it's way more nuanced. Okay. We've got the Hornet, the Eagle, the Fighting Falcon, three amazing jets. But bought and used differently. Let's get into it. Okay, so maybe start with uh, the obvious one, cost. Definitely cost. The F-16, I mean, that was its big selling point internationally. It was significantly cheaper. Cheaper to buy, cheaper to fly. Pretty much. And that meant countries could afford more of them. You could build up a larger force. Quantity having its own quality, like you said a wider net. Exactly. You get pretty good capability, but spread across more assets. Very attractive for many air forces. Okay, so that's the F-16's angle. Oh. What about the F-15 Eagle? That was the uh, the top dog for a long time. Oh, yeah. Performance-wise, especially range and air-to-air, -air, the F-15 was generally seen as superior, the undisputed king for air combat, really. There's always a but. But it was expensive, yeah. and initially it was very focused on that air superiority mission. Not so much the multi-role thing at first. Not the original models, no. That came later with the Strike Eagle, the F-15E, and that version actually sold pretty well internationally. Ah, okay. So the basic F-15 maybe didn't export widely? Relatively limited, yeah. Japan, Israel, Saudi Arabia were the main ones for the air superiority versions. Japan even built them under license. Interesting. So the Multirol Strike Eagle changed the game for F-15 exports. It certainly broadened its appeal, yes. Showed nations were willing to pay the premium if they got that ground attack capability too. So where did that leave the Hornet in the export market? It did sell, obviously. It did, but often for quite specific reasons. You look at Canada, they needed a twin-engine jet. Why twin-engine specifically? Think about their geography. Huge, sparsely populated areas, lots of maritime patrol. That second engine is a major safety factor when you're far from land or bases. Right. Redundancy. Makes total sense. And Finland, another Hornet user, mm -hmm. they valued its tougher landing gear. Tougher gear. For what? For operating from dispersed locations, maybe even roadways or austere strips if their main bases were knocked out. The Hornet was built robustly for carrier landings, which translated well. Ah, carrier strength paying off on land. Clever. But these were sort of niche requirements. You know, if you didn't need that specific twin engine setup or that super rugged undercarriage. The F-16 often looked like the better value proposition. Often, yes. Especially for nations balancing capability and budget. Its overall export numbers reflect that. In fact, the non-strike Eagle F-15 sales were roughly comparable to the Hornets. Okay, that paints the international picture. Now let's clip to the U.S. military itself. Big difference there. Huge difference. The U.S. Navy and the Marine Corps, they fly the Hornet and now the Super Hornet and Growler. And the main reason is... Carrier Ops. Simple as that. The F-15 and F-16 are land-based aircraft. They weren't designed for the stresses of catapult launches and arrested landings. Can't do the job if you can't take off on the boat. Precisely. That capability is non-negotiable for the Navy and Marines. The Hornet was designed from the ground up, well, building on the YF-17, for that. And the U.S. Air Force. They fly the Eagle and the Viper, the F-16. Exclusively, yeah. Well, a apart from a few F-16s used as aggressors mimicking enemy jets, but no Hornets in their main inventory. Why not? Just didn't need a carrier jet. Didn't need a carrier jet. And there's that bit of history, too. Remember the lightweight fighter competition? Uh, vaguely. YF-16 versus YF-17. That's the one. The YF-16 won that competition and became the F-16 Fighting Falcon for the Air Force. The YF-17, the loser... Got adapted by the Navy and became the F-A-18 Hornet. Exactly. So the Air Force had already picked its lightweight fighter, the F-16, alongside the heavier F-15 for air superiority. They didn't really have a role for the Hornet. So wrapping this up, it sounds like the Hornet wasn't necessarily seen as flawed, but more specialized. Or maybe just didn't fit the primary needs or budget of as many potential buyers compared to the F-16 or the specific high-end niche of the F-15. I think that's a fair summary. Cost was huge for the F-16 success. Specific needs drove Hornet buys like carrier ops for the U.S. Navy or those unique Canadian finish requirements. The F-15 offered top-tier performance, especially later with the multi-role Strike Eagle. So the best aircraft really depends entirely on who's asking, what they need it for, and crucially, what they can afford. Absolutely. It's always a trade-off. 
Always about matching the tool to the specific job and the resources available. It makes you think, doesn't it? How often do we assume there's one best solution when, really, the constraints and priorities completely change the answer? Something to ponder beyond just fighter jets. Definitely. Good deep dive.